Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Talking Leadership podcast. Thank you for joining me again with what is another in the new series of the global edition of the podcast. My name is Eric Perez. Thank you again for the support of the podcast. And today's guest hails from the Boston region of the United States. And I had the pleasure of talking to my guest about some of the politics in the US, which may have derailed this podcast because we could talk about that forever, but that's not the purpose of today's podcast. So my guest today is the CEO of Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. Can I welcome David Shapiro to the podcast? How are you, David? I'm doing great, Eric. Thanks so much for having me. Mate, I appreciate your time. I realize it's the afternoon in the US, so I won't keep you from your family and or um, a end of day drink and or your dinner. So so uh, we'll get started where, where I typically get started with these questions by asking, can you give us a bit of a sense as to your um, the beginnings of your leadership journey, uh, David? What Why leadership and what, what drew you to sticking your head up over the parapet to become a leader? It's a great question. And, and there are sort of, you know, two frames to me around leadership. It's sort of like when others consider you a leader and when you consider yourself a leader. Um, and, and those can be very similar times or very different times and they, they flex and flux as you go. I think a couple things happened for me, uh, I would say that were sort of helpful at a young age when thinking about leadership. One, I am the youngest of four. So I had three, I think birth order matters. And I had uh, three older siblings to watch. I would also say that at least as, as the arc of my family goes, my father, who was a first generation college graduate, his dad was a plumber and an immigrant from Russia and similar to my mom in the same generation, but he had gone to college, he had gone to law school. By the time I came around as the fourth, he was more secure and stable and confident in his own leadership, as was my mom. And so I got to watch a very stable set of leaders in my siblings discovering in my parents. Uh, my father was incredibly politically active, was the treasurer for the mayor of Baltimore City, uh, where I lived and, and was a civil rights lawyer and a negotiator and mediator. So I watched a lot of leadership. And then I went to a school, an all boys school that was very much about like, you know, men for other men, you know, they were constantly telling us that we were leaders and, and servants and that we were meant to lead others in ways that were both you know, sort of <laughs> probably wrong <laughs> now that I look back and elitist um, and also in ways that, you know, ingrained in you that if you were not a person for other people, then perhaps your life was a little bit empty. And so those values, that leadership got instilled in me. And then it just kept going, you know, everything from student government to captain of sports teams to sort of taking on the administration in my college around certain policies. Like it just kind of but I think a lot of that is like being born, being told now that I work in the work that I do around mentoring, being born told that your voice matters and watching other people's voice matter. There's a lot of young people who are told all the signals are sent to them that their voice doesn't matter and they have to figure out how to develop one. Uh, I, I was not that case. I, I had the privilege of being told from the beginning that my voice mattered and that my people expected to hear it. So I could then use it however I wanted, uh, but it was an expectation leadership almost from the beginning. We could talk about that for the, the entirety of the podcast, particularly around the formative times that led, led you to becoming a leader or having that mindset. And, and I have to say for every podcast guess it's been different. So some came strictly from family, which you mentioned, Others came in from being the, being the kind of individual that puts their hand up to do things because you wouldn't have it any other way or you're not hardwired to sit back and let others set the agenda for you. And, and I think I cast my mind back to my two, my, my two boys who are um, well into their teens, but when they were a lot younger, the, the younger one couldn't just stand, sit there and not take part and direct some of the play for himself. And you could see it at a young age and you, he, he wouldn't have called it leadership and I wasn't thinking about it that way, but you can see it from the very young. So I appreciate that, that as a introduction to the next theme. And this, this one is interesting to me because I, I guess each of you as leaders has had a different pathway to this. Do you see any real differences between the leadership function and the management function in your travels, David? 
I mean, I do. I think, you know, again, the words probably matter less than the behaviors. So a, a lot of it is around how you think about yourself and you think about your primary role and your pri primary relationship with others. But what I would say I see as the difference, and they're both different kinds of burdens and different kinds of privileges. Management is a human engineering task. Ma management is about how you bring people together, keep people together, keep the steps going, redirect the steps when the steps are off, deal with failure, deal with success, and, and sort of get to whatever the optimal end is with people feeling positive about that end. Because if you destroy people along the way, I mean, that's management, but it's bad management. But if you can get people to the end, um, there is a lot of elements of, of leadership in that. But leadership to me, how it's different from management is that it requires a certain sense of looking ahead of the project that is going on in that moment. It's a certain liberation to look around corners. It's a communication task around articulating a place that might be further down the road. It's giving people a sense of the why of everything instead of just the how. It's a coalescing act of either from the side, back, or front saying, we're pointing in that direction. That's the North Star. There are managers to help us figure out how we get to the North Star, but I can just tell you that we're getting to that North Star and there's a set of reasons why and let me tell you about three years ago when we set that as the North Star, giving people a sense of narrative and history and arc, and then managing is managing to it. And those to me, you know, are two a little different functions. So let me ask you, David, this one, not necessarily a negative, but I, I feel I need to ask it because then it, it's part of being a leader. And I call this the lonely road of leadership. Do you think it's a pathway that necessarily needs to be lonely or there is always going to be an element of leadership that's about the individual because you've, you've got to be introspective and um, pick out in your own mind what are priorities and sometimes others can influence that, but essentially it's up to you because you are the leader. If you weren't the leader or the one uh, uh, setting that direction, then anyone could be doing it. So there wouldn't be a need to have leadership or because I, I think this top, this particular theme is more nuanced than I've given it credit for. So from your perspective, is it a lonely road? Is it as lonely as you make it? What, 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 what do you see it as Dave? Well, <laughs> it's a lonely road that's crowded with people. <laughs> I mean, there, there are, uh, there are always, uh, you know, if you're doing it right, you're not doing it in a vacuum. You're doing it with and alongside and being informed by lots and lots of people. And as infrequently as possible, you are finding yourself as a lone arbiter. If you're a lone arbiter, that should be a, that should be like the, that should happen the least amount of times. You know, if you feel like you're making lots and lots of decisions by yourself, that is a problem, I would say. I think you should be reducing the amount to which you have to be a lone arbiter or a lone mediator. But the hardest things <laughs> inevitably are going to be the things no one else wants to deal with, or there isn't an easy answer and you need to figure out. And that is, is definitely lonely. It should still be informed by lots of voices, but there are moments of loneliness and the burden can be. I think if you're doing it right, if you truly believe yourself to be a representative servant leader of other people's values and wishes and opinions, and you're a synthesizer of all that, and then there are times when you have to come up with the wisest path based on that synthesis, then it can feel, that burden can feel lonely. I think narcissistic leaders don't feel lonely because they generally believe whatever they decided was the greatest thing and that they're not representative of all these other people. They don't feel beholden to others. And so there's not much burden in feeling beholden to others. I literally wake up every morning feeling like I don't have a monopoly on any wisdom. I'm just lucky enough to be informed by lots of things and people. And that allows me to hopefully synthesize that and make good representative decisions. That feels that can feel lonely, even though it's crowded with people. <laughs> that that yeah, thank you, thank you for that. I was I was just thinking then when you describe the narcissistic leader, that that definition tends to fall 
on the shoulders of a certain class of people in our society that will remain uh, nameless, <laughs> but I think people can work out who I'm talking about. Not all of them, but a good swathe of them, or at least the, some of the some of the ones that I've um, had the uh, the pleasure to meet in my travels, at least. Um, yeah, that that makes sense, and and I think you you make your leadership journey as alone or as informed as you need it to be, and it really depends on the individual. Because I've met some people that essentially do everything you're talking about but the end in the end I, I, I think one of the things to tease out of this theme is that the making of the ultimate decision so if you're going to fire someone or you're going to demote someone that's a big decision and it's something that that if you've got a conscience and you're not narcissistic and you worry about the other that you're going to be thinking about what are the consequences of the decisions that you make and that's where i think uh going back to your, your definition before the distinction between leadership and management is managers can sometimes walk away from that decision whereas that's left up to the leader and the consequences um, are sometimes not discussed very well for people in leadership roles that if you're having to do this a lot that if you if you do have a, a soul so to speak it's going to get impacted by those decisions and it's i think it's what you sign up for when you take on the job that that's uh what one of those elements of um any any contract that you might enter into there are some elements that may not be to your liking but they're going to be there whether you like them or not yeah i mean i think if you have a certain level of intellectual curiosity if you have a certain uh, humility about the certainty of answers uh and if you believe that you represent other people. I mean, that's a big thing. Representing other people is a huge and wonderful privilege and very difficult burden to feel accountable to a set of other people. You know, then I think that it's going to, it's going to feel lonely. I mean, but I think, you know, that old cliche, ignorance is bliss. I think there are definitely a set of leaders. A lot of times I can certainly find myself, you know, prone to being jealous of them who just feel incredibly certain. They don't feel the burden of representation and they're just doing it and they feel great about doing it. Sometimes I think they evolve into that. You know, I, I sometimes think about the mayor of a city, you know, who walks by people who are unemployed or people who are homeless, right? I mean, if you feel deeply as a mayor, it would be hard to walk by those people and not feel like a certain part of that is my responsibility. But if you're mayor in order to sleep at night, there's also a certain part of you that over time says, well, that's a lot, really thorny issue and the last person didn't solve it. So I'm trying as hard as I can. And then over time, you just get numb to some of the things you represent and some of the hardest issues. And I imagine that might be something you need to do to stay sane, but representing people is, is, is <laughs> it's going to be a burden and it's going to be lonely and it's going to be a privilege if you're doing it right. Yeah, I, I agree. And thank you, David, because this, this brings up potentially a theme I'll, I'll, I'll steal off you here because you, you haven't put a, uh, a copyright on it, so I may use it, that, that leadership in some senses is about representation and that you're not going to be a leader with any authority if, you're not, if you don't have people to lead or a group that you're representing. So that, that makes a lot of sense. So let, let's move, if we can, to something a bit more positive in, uh, and I call this measuring success. Now, for you, um, and it doesn't have to be as crass as, well, well, the KPI, I hit all my KPIs this month. What, what do you, as a leader, David, see as a measure of success for you that may not necessarily be in your position description in your job? The number one thing for me is if people see themselves in victories. That's it. I mean, that's really what it's all about. If, if they feel a sense of shared responsibility in missteps and that there's always room to course correct, that's, that's a sense of leadership. When things go wrong, they feel like we're in it together. We can learn from it. It's not a deficiency in us. And we can do better. There's always a sense of possibility in things that don't go right and a sense of learning and continuous improvement. And then when things go right, they see themselves in that victory. They know what part they played. They know that it took all of us. They feel themselves represented in that. So for me in the KPIs, that could be a legislative victory around the amount of federal money that's being spent on youth mentoring. It could be around us landing a new corporation that wants training for managers and managing with a mentoring mindset. It could be starting a new affiliate in a given new American state, like launching Mentor in Georgia. But I want, while I may be the person standing up there at some point, 
I want everybody, every single step, the first person who made that suggestion to see themselves in that accomplishment. And to me, that's, that's effective leadership. That's what success looks like to me, the more people who share in the successes and understand how it happened. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite an interesting job that you have that it's almost you, your daily work line. I can't speak for every minute that you're in your office, obviously, but when you're talking about mentoring, it is, it is part of that leadership process, whether people become leaders after it or not is there's elements of leadership or being able to mimic positive behaviors from somebody else to help them step up from whatever quagmire they might be in. And that um, I'll, I'll get to mentoring a bit later because I'm sure you're going to have some uh, insights <laughs> that some of my other guests haven't had. So I've, I've built up to this and this one is, is of particular interest to me because in my spare time, I'm trying to finish some postgraduate studies around leadership development and um, successfully, I might add, but it's, it's been a long road, particularly when I've been doing it part time. But leader capabilities. So you've, you've mentioned a few or you've directly said these are things that are critical to you that a leader needs to have. But if I had to ask you your top five, your top three, what, what are those critical leader capabilities that if they're not there, you're not going to have as an effective leader as you might otherwise have had? Communication, authenticity, discipline. All right, can you unpack each of them a little bit for me? So by communication, what elements of communication do you think are the most critical? So actually, the first one would be to be able to listen, which is not what people always think about when they think about communicating. Um, but, but to be able to listen to lots of voices and then represent them in a cohesive and clear narrative where you're representing maybe many opinions, but it's in, with clarity um, about choices about economics, about relative risk, about the values. You have to be able to communicate about all of those. And well, we'll come to accountability, but, but you have to communicate with clarity about where you are, where you want to go, how you're going to get there, what's driving you, what role everybody's playing. So just the clarity of an effectiveness of your listening, synthesizing and communicating, and your ability to customize that communication for different stakeholders based on their wants, needs, and desires. That's one. If you can't do that, you can't do anything. I think second is authenticity. I mean, I think people are yearning for authenticity, you know, and, and there isn't a lot of it in the world. There isn't a yeah, lot so, of so, so before you go on, David, one, one thing yeah. I'd like to throw in the mix here is that it can depend on the industry or the group of people you work with. So I tend to say to people with commercial fishing families and people in this industry, their BS radar is so attuned that if you're not authentic, they will know pretty much straight away that there's no, they need time to work out whether you're full of something. They just know straight away. And I, I think um, I've, I never called it authentic leadership or authenticity, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting more enamored with that as a concept that to be a more effective leader, so you can be a leader without it, how successful you are long-term is a relative question and it would be interesting to measure that. But I, I, I do believe that authenticity is something that people assume leaders have. And I don't think they always have it or, or if they could develop it, that they're interested in doing that because at times some leaders just want the job done. They don't care if you don't think they're authentic or not. They just have a task to do. Uh, so I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. You. I want to keep going. Yeah. No, I think it's a perfect, I think it's a perfect thought. And, and I think that, and a perfect example around folks being able to suss it out pretty quickly. I think that, you know, I think the the difference is that if you are going to be authentically yourself, that means you're also going to give people bad news. It means you're also going to be honest about the choices that have to be made. It also means you're going to be honest about when you're not the person for the job. And I, you don't meet a lot of people who will do all three of those things, you know, who will disappoint people, who will, you know, say, this is a tough choice and we have to make this one. And who say, you know what, I'm not the person for this moment. You probably are, or that person is. And so 
that level of authenticity is just rarely found in people. I think people are yearning for it. And it is at different levels, you know, like people will accept certain levels of it if they feel you come through. But I think, and I can only speak for here in the States, but the young, the folks coming up have very little faith in the authenticity of leadership and institutions because they've seen both disappoint them so many times, um, at least in America. And so it's a real separator if you have it. But trust is low. People's meters, as you said, their antenna are constantly up looking for when you're not acting according to what you're saying. And it's hard. It's hard to always be consistent with what you're saying. Sure. I, I, I don't think I've met uh, anyone. And I, I say this with, with, with all due respect to people in, in any leadership role that is fully self-actualized. If you get that kind of leader, you want them being a president. You want them being a prime minister. Um, a fully self-actualized human being that can do that kind of stuff would mean no ego, complete service to others, almost perfect decision. It, it would be difficult to find someone like that. What was the third capability that you mentioned, David? I, I, I... Yeah, discipline and accountability. And, and, and I think that's just like, as a leader, again, you're given a certain amount of freedom when no one's looking or even when people are looking to change the calculus. You know, maybe people don't remember what you said six months ago, or they don't remember the last decision you made, or you're in a new room with a new set of people. And so they don't know how you dealt with the last set of people. But if you're truly disciplined, authentic, accountable for your communications, accountable for what you say you're going to do and the values you're going to do it with, that just requires a lot of discipline because there are a lot of opportunities when nobody's looking and you have positional authority to make an inconsistent decision because in that moment it would be easier or because you're emotional in that moment and you want to react to your emotion. Um, you have that freedom positionally and you have to reject it. David, I have to say that's easier said than done. I'm, I'm in that school that sometimes my emotions will override my common sense and logic when making a decision. And it's, it's something that I have to keep working on on a regular basis. And that, that, um, it's part of who I am. So it's something I know that I've got to grapple with uh, long term. And I think others have got that same issue, maybe to different degrees that um, in positions of leadership, you also know that ultimately you are accountable for the team and human nature suggests and what I've seen of, of people in leadership roles is that you want to try and get the best outcome, not necessarily to be right, but to always be looking to get a positive outcome, whatever that might look like. And at some point, uh, and this this is something I haven't discussed a lot, but I might bring up now to see what your thoughts are, that you get so ingrained in a culture of where you work that it's sometimes difficult to split the you, your, you yourself, your, your own personal idiosyncrasies from the job itself. And, and I've come to that after 10 years of being an advocate in the same industry. I'm still a passionate advocate, but I'm not a dispassionate advocate because I, I do care about what happens to these people that, that I've come to respect in the industry that I work in and I think when you get to that point you start asking yourself maybe you need to separate a little bit for your own mental health and to, to make better decisions because I, I think once you become ingrained in the group it's hard to, to separate and do some of the things that you're talking about does that does that ring true for you yeah I think it does I mean I, I think that it's it's um I think everything that we have talked about in the last 10 minutes or so has all to do with surrounding yourself with people who you are asking to challenge you and help, help you do these things. Because the only way you're going to do accountability, communication, be dispassionate, be disciplined, be consistent, is if you've surrounded you with people who remind you like, oh God, Eric's going to tell me like, this isn't how we did this last time. Or Eric's going to tell me no one knows what the hell I'm talking about. Or Eric's going to tell me, say exactly what you want to do so that you hold yourself accountable for this. Because this is a hard thing you're about to try to do with a low likelihood of success. But say it out loud, and then you can hold yourself accountable. You know, like it's only going to be in other people that you trust and, and who are willing to give you hard truth and who are willing to go on the journey with you. That That's the only way is fellow travelers are the only people who are going to allow you to do these things. I would say the same about the issue you just said. That's really hard for me because the personalization of your work is like the ultimate privilege if your work matters that much to you. Sure. There's no question that it could eat you alive 
and make you no longer good at the science of your job. But if you truly care that much, you should also be pretty damn good at it. And that's sort of really lucky as well. So I, that's a fine line, the personalization of it. It is, it is, because um, I, I wake up, I look forward to, do, to doing the work that I do much, much differently to many of the um, uh, started and failed careers I had when I was a younger man. And, you know, I'm in my mid 40s. So I don't consider myself young, but I don't consider myself near retirement. So I've had some experience. And uh, yeah, I've, I've got to say that the position I hold now is one where I wake up and I look as much as I gripe about some of the challenges, I actually look forward to the to the fight, as it were, because it, it, it keeps the grey matter going. So I uh, fully agree with what you were saying before. Nature versus nurture, David. Um, are leaders born or made? I, I think that leaders are called, you know, to moments. I think there was a book, I don't know how long ago, but it's one of my favorites, um, called The Leadership Moment. And... It basically is just case studies on different people who rose to different moments. But what I like about it is that it doesn't prescribe that like there's eight qualities that every leader has. It says that there's, there's different people called different moments, you know, like there's, if you're a flamethrower, there might be moments for you. If you're a mediator, there might be moments for you. If you're someone with lived experience, there might be moments for you, you know, in, in whatever the issue is. And so I think leaders are called. I think there is a lot in nature and nurture that before that moment when they're called prepares them for that moment. And so the question is kind of like for people who want to be leaders or hope to be leaders is like, what are you doing for to prepare for that calling? I, I think. How are you getting better every day? Because who knows when you'll be called to different facets of leadership. It may be to mediate a hard moment. Just, it's not about position. It may be to enter a burning building. You know, it, it may be, you know, to try to get someone to be better than they were the day before. I, I don't know. There's like tons of acts of leadership that have nothing to do with positional leadership. Um, and so I think it's a lot about preparing for that moment. So when I talk to people about nature versus nurture, I mean, there's definitely some people who are born with some innate qualities that make them, you know, really, really good at this. I, communication probably being, you know, one of the biggest ones. Um, great writers, great speakers have huge advantages. Um, and that is something you can develop. But, you know, if you grow up around great communicators, if you are just passionate about studying words and communication, you're going to be better if you have charisma. Um, but, you know, being invested in another human being having the courage to act. These are things that you're going to be called to and you're going to draw on your life experience. I'm not sure there's a book to help you with those things, but there is life experience to help you with those things. Yeah. That, uh, that there's, there's a lot of truth in that. I, I guess for those that, that volunteer in, in their, um, in their lives. So, so some service to someone else or a group, um, I, I, I do that with my school, so, so I'm heavily involved in my school and their parents and citizens uh, association. Others do it by volunteering to help the homeless or whatever that is, that um, you can find those things in that service without necessarily terming it that way. So I'm, I'm glad you made the distinction because when I ask this question, it's not so much about positional leadership and you've actually thrown up a third element they're born made you know are they born made or is it a calling at a particular point in time and that that you can see that with our political leaders through COVID-19 I think we all got sideswiped by this and so critiquing someone's response I think is disingenuous uh, we've tried our best to respond in the best way we can the only the only time I think a critique is valid is when there's been no action taken at all that that to me is not a position so status quo when you've got a pandemic, and I, I hate that word, but it's it's the word that's used, that when you've got a global emergency, if you want to call it that, that inaction to me is not is not an option. You've got to try and do something. And in that trying to do something, okay, it may, it may not be successful, but at least you've given it uh, a red hot go. And that that that's what I think you're talking about there. And and moments of, of leadership, for example, uh, in, in Queensland, for those that might be listening that don't know Australia well, but in my state, particularly in the north of this state, 
There are a lot of natural um, phenomena that happen every year, cyclones and very extreme weather. And sometimes you get small ones that dissipate to nothing and sometimes they wipe out two or three towns and you've got to galvanise to get up there and, and provide assistance for people to recover. And you see people just step up to do things they would not normally do without being asked to do it. It's just just something clicks in your brain. And I, I, I think that comes to what some of the themes that you brought out here is a sense of community. Um, others might call it something else, but I, th I think if you're not invested in other human beings then you're not having a good time of it being alive, I don't think, because we're not isolated and I don't think people like being alone from what, what I've seen in my travels. Um, look, David, here, here's the final theme and, and this one I'm particularly interested in because you, you, you've drawn a lot of critical things together that are important for someone listening to this. And again, I do this to help others with their leadership journey. Just listening to what you've been saying would be, um, you could start a little course on, the, on that on its own. But I want to ask you, um, looking back at your leadership pathway to a younger David, what would you tell that, that, that uh, younger David about what is effective leadership and what would you advise them to do a little differently than you've done to date? Um, I think that I would try to remind him that there is no end point, <laughs> that there is not some place that you're going to arrive at. I think I, that probably had some notion of an archetype that there would be a moment when I, I would feel like I was a leader, or had arrived at leadership. And I think I would just try to get him to be more patient with like, your goal should not be to become a leader. Your goal should be to become a little better person or leader every day. And that's that's the goal. It's the process. Try to get better every day. Try, try, to, try to listen to different voices every day than you've ever listened to before. Try to have hard conversations because they will make you better and expand your horizons. But make sure that you're continuing to develop as a leader every day not that you're arriving as a leader. I think the other thing I would probably, because I come from a long line of pleasers, people who want to please other people, I think I would also try to help him get comfortable with the fact that harmony doesn't equal great leadership all the time, that everyone being happy and pleased doesn't equal great leadership, that sometimes great leadership disrupts or upsets or is in conflict. It doesn't, it's never going to be natural for me to seek that out. I like harmony. I like compromise. I like agreement. Um, so I wouldn't advise this for other people. Some people lean a different way, but I lean this way. And so I definitely went to work the first day that I supervised a lot of people and thought, I should just see if they're all happy. And when they seemed unhappy, I was like, oh my God, I'm failing. And I remember like my older brother was like, dude, you don't know what's going on in their lives. Like, there could be a lot of things going on in your lives. It's not their, your job to make them happy. That's a terrible definition of leadership. But that I kind of thought like harmony and happiness were my only, I mean, that's obviously a part of it. You would like to have a positive workplace. But yeah, I just wish I, I, I would tell myself, like, don't make those your North Stars and be patient with the process or just lean into the process, make the process the thing. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. And that's a very good advice for people starting out in leadership roles of whatever kind, whether they're for profit or not for profit, that um, it's almost like, uh, and, and I've, I've had this discussion with my, my, my wife, my better half on this, that uh, her, her leadership style, she wants to bring people in and create friendships. And I said, that can be dangerous because you can respect people, but not necessarily be the best of friends in a work context. And if that fails, then is it a failure of your leadership or is it a failure because you just couldn't know how to, how to make a friendship in the workplace? And that, that is difficult. And what you just talked about, about making everyone happy, I don't think that's humanly possible because you don't know the, the other uh, 16, 14 hours that people don't spend in the workplace of what they're doing and what, is their life challenges. And if you tried to take that on, I think your brain would just melt. You, you, you wouldn't I, last too long as a leader is what I, I think you're trying to say. Yeah. And I will give you an example from recently in our current reality, because it's still, a, it's still, a, you know, something I'm, we all got to know what our blind spots are and 
what our kryptonite is and what we're working on every day. I was really frustrated talking to one of my colleagues around, she was saying, people feel this and people feel that. And it was a lot around uncertainty and it was a lot around burnout. A lot of the things, you know, that are, that are sort of always true, but especially true right now as people meld their work and personal lives in the COVID reality. I kept saying to her, like, I'm working my ass off. I've been writing weekly diary entries to our workforce about what to expect and how little I know and letting them in on my own life of just trying to like shower and get ready for every day. And I feel like I couldn't be more human and transparent and vulnerable with them every week. And I'm giving of myself, I'm accessible to them. And uh, she finally, after she listened to me complain for a while, and talk about my burden, as you talked about earlier. She said, David, do you know the kind of uncertainty that people are living with right now in their overall lives? This is not about mentor. This is not about our workplace. There's nothing you could do to take away the uncertainty of a global pandemic. People feel out of control. They don't know when their kids are going to be back to daycare. They don't know when they're going to get to leave their houses. Like, this isn't about us. There's you should keep doing what you're doing, but it's bigger than us. And that was, you know, again, a great moment for me because I was holding myself accountable for them all feeling wonderful about the world in the midst of a global pandemic. And I'm sure that makes me a better boss and leader, but it, but it was not a realistic appraisal of the role I could play in their lives. And I was driving myself crazy over it. And she she brought me back, you know, and, and that's that's what you need around you is people that bring you back. That's excellent. That, that's a brilliant example. And I think um, uh, trying to be, um, trying to play that role of, of almost um, a, uh, providing a, a safe environment for your staff or your, your colleagues is in these circumstances probably beyond our capability. Not that you couldn't try to do it, but I think it's uh, such a big thing that's going on at the moment and you know, COVID-19, I don't remember anything in my working life that could rival it, that it's still a, it's still creating, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That, that uncertainty and change that is constantly coming now has been magnified. So people's level of comfort with change has now been ramped up to the point where uncertainty is in our face every day. And uh, some people don't thrive on having uncertainty i don't think anybody likes it but you find those that can deal through it are the ones that will come out better the other side but i've got to say there's going to be an industry of what happened through covid for the next 10 or 20 years of people writing about this incident that um, is already starting to frustrate me particularly like I, I, i live on linkedin and i see it coming up all the time courses on how to deal with LinkedIn and how to embrace your people. I'm like, if you didn't know this stuff before COVID hit, what kind of leader were you before it hit? Yeah, I mean, this has been my main point with my people, which again, this gets back, and I know we'll probably wrap it up, but this gets back to the communication, discipline, accountability, consistency, which is to say, and I've been saying this from the day we left our office, not sure when we would return. This is only going to accentuate our values. It's going to accentuate our positives. It's going to accentuate our negatives, but it's only going to accentuate who we are. It's not going to change us. And the world is going to try to tell you that it's a new normal and everything's changing and the world's going to try to make this very dramatic. But I will tell you, if we are who we say we are, if we are who we think we are, it's only going to make us lean harder on our values and the things that we most believe in. And I'm reminding my folks of that all the time. Excellent. David, that is an extremely positive way to end the podcast. For those listening, you've been tuning in again to Talking Leadership. My podcast guest today is uh, David Shapiro, the CEO of Mentor, the National Mentoring uh, Partnership based out of Boston. David, thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric, so much for having me on. It was a great conversation. Not a worry. Uh, for those listening, thank you again, and I'll join you all on the next podcast.